Welcome, folks. You're here at Race Matters. This is Brother Eddie Carson, and you're listening to WJOP 96.3, Joppa Radio. And we have some folks in the house tonight because here in the studio, we're going to talk a little bit about thinking about Newburyport, thinking about this area, and really leaning in to this notion of anti-racism within communities. And we have some organizers here who are at the forefront of making this happen. I'm just, I'm just a servant following the lead of folks and everything too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna welcome folks to the microphone here, if that works, and let them kind of introduce themselves a little bit. So let's see, you know what? I'm gonna start Anne with you. Ann Upton's in the house here. Ann, say hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm Ann Upton. I'm the Inclusion Specialist with Youth Services at the YWCA Greater Newburyport. Thank you, Ann. Amanda Bradbury is here as well. Yes. Amanda, introduce yourself <laughs> for us. Hi, my name is Amanda Bradbury, and I am the Director of Youth Services at the YWCA Newburyport. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Our celebrities here, too. <laughs> Paula Esty. Paula, come on, tell us a little bit about yourself. So, my name is Paula Esty, and I'm the Executive Director for the PEG Center for Art and Activism here in New Report. We've been doing it for six, seven years, and we also uh, run the Women in Action Huddle in Greater New Report. I love it. I love it, my friends. You know, one of the things we're going to delve into is um, we're going to kind of talk about an array of things as it relates to, to anti-racism, especially as we lean in and how we bring white folks to the fold, right? I mean, as part of the, the arm that's going to take place, too, but also in the ways in which y'all are doing your own work, too, in the sense of kind of coalescing, because I'm just a soul brother, I'm a servant, and I'm here in the house with these awesome folks in terms of the work that we're going to do. So I, you know, Paul, I'm going to start with you. And folks, feel free to chime in any way we do this. Where did the idea for the this anti-racist organizing, this anti-racist community initiative come from? And, and what's, your, what's your vision, your ambition for this? So... At the beginning of January, I asked Amanda and Anne to meet with me just to start a conversation about collaborating, because that's part of what the PEG Center does is reach out to other organizations so that together we can amplify the messages that we are trying to get out there. And so I just wanted to have a conversation with these two beautiful women about what they do at the YWCA. I, I saw what they did last year because the PEG Center asked them if they would lead children in writing love letters to Uvalde on the anniversary of the massacre there. And I saw them in action with the children that they work with. The cards were magnificent. They spoke to the children so openly and honestly and, and appropriately about something horrible that had happened. So I knew I wanted to work with them. And, you know, the YWCA is an anti-racist community organization and so that's really where we started and out of that this seed idea came for doing a series and you being the only black man that I know and love shoot I'm the only black man like me around this area <laughs> in general said, not a lot of folks let's ask like Eddie. that and yeah. you had this poised and ready to go talk and out of I mean it's been beautiful what we've done it's absolutely beautiful what we've done my goal, and I was thinking about this this afternoon, is that I, I want to live in a diverse community. I happen to live right here. How can me and my organization bring that about? And I don't want to talk too long, but part of the conversation that Amanda and Anne and I were very frustrated by is that we had these great ideas and they fell like, but we live here. Now what are we going to do to really affect change? And I remember you and I had had a conversation last Absolutely. summer about all of this. So look at the serendipity of the four of us being together. In it. Hey, it puts a smile on my face. 
And Amanda, I want to welcome y'all into the fold just here for a little bit too. And, and you know, we just heard what Paula had to say about this. What are your thoughts, your reflection and thinking about community, thinking about anti-racism and the importance of creating this semblance of of allyship, co-conspirator, and how do we move folks closer to that notion of radical love that we know all about? So definitely, yeah, I, can we, can we I'd, like, I'd like you to take it just because. Sure. So I've actually been working here with the YWCA since 2003. And so coming down into the community, I've been able to work where the mission of the organization being eliminating racism and empowering women is something that I've really been able to indoctrinate myself into. I was raised in um, definitely a much more diverse um, community than here in Newburyport and very quickly was like, geez, this is going to be really different. How am I going to? And, and began sort of, I've always been the type of educator who likes to create my own curriculums. I love creating curriculums for kids, learning who the children are and how I can connect with them. And so I instantly started coming up with curriculums that had to do with race and then recently became the chair of our racial justice committee at the YWCA, which sort of threw me into um, needing to produce certain events that we would have yearly and, and, and what do I want to do beyond that. And having worked with Paula, as she said, we worked together last spring and one of the things I knew I wanted to do was to somehow utilize the children, you know, since COVID, uh, my job's landscape has changed as many people have and I am now back in with children <laughs> every afternoon and have been since COVID, um, which wasn't exactly my position beforehand, but it put me in a position where I was back again, really looking at curriculum and wanting to create curriculum with children in the schools and I just knew that I wanted to see more traction than just what we were doing in the after school program and so wanting to lean out and how can I collaborate and do more here in the community than just what I'm doing inside of the after school program and, and bring the kids with me. That's really my expertise is how to do families and kids. So they're doing they're doing an art um, project with the kids called What Color Am the I? Colors like me. The colors so like, like me. Yeah. And it's gonna come to the Peg Center when it's done. So another perfect mm -hmm. collaboration for us oh, all. Oh, I'm excited about that. And I want to hear your thoughts on all of this. Yeah. I, well, I jumped on and worked. Uh, I was hired at the YWCA. Amanda and I have had a relationship in education for what, since, I don't know, at least 10 years. Yeah. Um, sure. And I joined you officially two years ago. And um, when you came on as chair for the Racial Justice Committee, it was just a no-brainer that you asked me to join you as well. Um, I come from a very diverse cultural background, grew up in cities. Worcester, Mass was my hometown, New York City. and. Um, have been in your report raising my two boys for the past 20 years and it's just been a, a real mm. eye-opener to uh, the lack of diversity that's here. So. Yeah, it's interesting and there are a lot of ways in which we can delve into that and that's kind of part of this whole community anti-racism organization and organizing folks to coalesce around notions of how do we move folks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Closer to the fold of thinking about how we are going to challenge racism and we know racism is quite ubiquitous in so many ways right. um, that being the case we're going to start all of this off on March 5th tell us about March 5th Paula so um, that's your moment to shine and to lead the troops and launch this series on March 5th at 6.30 p.m. at the FRS Unitarian Universalist Church in downtown Newreport. You are going to kick us off with a speech called Being Black in White Spaces. And what is the byline of your talk? In brave spaces, bringing folks together, right? Because one of the things we have to do it's as easy for me to step to the front and, and, and talk and point things out, but right, how do we really help folks think about their own identity, the identity of others? What does it mean for me as a black man, for other folks of color, to navigate through spaces, sometimes going back to that brother Ralph Ellison and thinking about his book Invisible Man, mm -hmm. where you see me, but you see me as this character, but you don't really see me, that kind of hints and leans towards these vestiges, the past problems when it comes to race and white supremacy. And oftentimes I have come to the conclusion that people engage in behavior that is 
in which they're not even conscious about, yeah. right? And so we think about being black and white spaces and really the fold of the message here is folks, right? I'm a brother, I'm a soul brother from the South and I'm here to really profess ideas of radical love. But yet, as we do this in an interracial way because anti-racism is interracial, right? Anti-racism is loving trans folks, queer folks, gay folks, right? Indigenous, we can go on and on and on. Folks are not able-bodied. And yet, we do things that we're unaware of. Mm. Things that make folks like me feel a little nervous just because, you know, I've walked into those spaces and I've seen someone move over into part of the store. Oh, yeah, right here in Newburyport. Yep. And they start cleaning that space just a little too long as they're keeping their eye on me. Right? Those are the folks who are conscious what they're doing versus those who are unconscious in terms of what they're doing with the, you know, the double looks, the stares, the whatever. But my favorite folks, I'll tell you, my favorite folks are the ones who are just so excited to see a brother like that, like me, that they're so overly kind. Yeah. And, and, and I'm okay with that. And I do the same thing, right? I, you know, I encounter folks, maybe folks who are not able-bodied, and I go out of my way, yeah. and, and that's okay. And I think that's part of what we want to really kind of get started. So we're going to engage. Go ahead. Well, I... I think I really want to say that the series that we are all involved in launching is an organic we've we've designed it to be pretty organic. It starts with you and the hard conversation. It starts with that conversation because a lot of us don't even know that we're doing what we're doing or not seeing what we aren't seeing. And then we, the first event after that is the first community conversation where we're inviting people of color to just talk to us, to talk to us what it's been like to live in a community like New Report. We then go to our second community conversation, which is about talking to families, and Amanda and Anne will be in charge of, they'll be the leaders of that conversation. And we end with the most important one of all, which is what we're going to do about it. Absolutely. What's our commitment? So in terms of timeline, right? <laughs> so we're looking at, so I'm going to kick things off March 5th, and oh, let me tell you, I'm going to move yeah. folks. The Holy Spirit's going to be in that room, and we're going to do that read into the Holy Spirit comment, whatever way you want to read into it, right? So that's March 5th. Tell me about the second one. The second one is March 21st. <clears throat> the following the following three are all on Thursday nights, um, April 18th and May 16th, which is the final one. Okay. So y'all have March the, you know, the, help me out, we have March 21st, 21st then. And then... April 18th is April the family, 18th. Conversa family conversation. Okay, so Amanda, and kind of help us understand the April 18th gathering yeah. that we're going to have. That's a part of this whole series that mm -hmm. we're doing. Yeah, so basically we're going to feature um, this year's version of a curriculum that I've run through the program many, many times. Um, and it's, it's a way to have those first conversations with children about race because a lot of times we, we think that we're anti-racist, but in truth, we're just not racist, meaning we aren't actively doing anything that's racist, but we're not, all, not doing anything active against racism either. And so a lot of kids really have no concept of what that even means. So the curriculum that I run with them is after we've done usually a whole, ser whole series about MLK and the Civil Rights Movement, which we've already done with our kids this year. And then this one sort of kicks in with the science behind skin color and how we all get the color we get and mm -hmm. why we look the way we look and how it kind of shows where we came from and the science of where the equator is and why you needed as much melanin as you need. And then it sort of tips over and starts the conversation of, well, when did we come up with this category of race and what does that mean? And why was that developed? And why do we categorize people into race? You know, originally just black and white, and now we have a few more different things you can be when someone says race as well. And it kind of moves kids over there and understanding the strategy behind having this type of a category. And then we move into actual racism and moving into some of those things that kids don't realize that they're already being taught. Um, the things that they don't see, the things that they don't realize, them understanding that 
nobody really talks about why there aren't as many books about black people in our library and nobody really talks to them about why there really aren't a lot of black people in Newburyport and all of those things and teaching them that the only way that we can actually do anything about racism is we have to recognize it so it's learning about all those concepts and things that we've all been taught in our in movies in books it's around us everywhere and how do we start conversations with other people as we're seeing racism and letting them know oh you know this is actually racism and doing it in a very educational way, teaching kids that we can all take steps to do better as a community and to really be conscientious in the way that we step forward in an anti-racist environment, which is what we create in the classroom that we are in. It's a very conscientious, you have to be very strategic to create an anti-racist classroom as opposed to just mm -hmm. a classroom that's not racist. And on April 18th, <clears throat> excuse me, you and Anne will be talking to families Correct. about how to talk about yep. race yep. and what we'll it be. means and, you know, all of that. And, and some of the fears that we know that adults have in conversations with kids and, 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 you know, even just when we did the civil rights movement, one of the big things that came up was, you know, some of our kids really had a hard time. It's, it's hard to hear what happened and a lot of times people don't talk to them in real terms or say anything factual yeah. and hearing the real facts of some of the things that might have occurred um, we, we focused on children so Ruby Bridges was a big one that we did and they knew the they knew the rough story but they didn't know a lot of the details they didn't know that she was in a classroom alone for a year. They didn't know that they had to bring a teacher down from Boston. Right. They didn't know that people waited out front of the school for her every single day trying to scare her into not coming in. Mm. And so having these conversations with kids and they asked those really big questions. I had a five-year-old ask me, she said, why? Why would they do this? And I think people, that's where people stop. Mm. They think if they don't have a concrete answer to that, that they can't have the conversation with the child. And critical thinking starts there. It's you can still have a conversation and it's about processing the fact that I don't 100% understand why right, either. Right. I know some things about it. I can give some background. I can absolutely explain that the people in, in that particular community had been taught this. They really believed it. It wasn't just about being mean. They really felt that this was the right way. And then we can we can just keep having conversations until the child is ready to move on or wants to ask. And that stops a lot of people from these conversations with their kids. And the other thing I think that stops them is they forget that in order to, you have to generate these conversations. When you're in a community that's predominantly white that's right. and predominantly wealthy, if you haven't put things in your house, if I don't put things in my classroom, the conversations can never come up. Mm -hmm. The children are never exposed to anything that ever brings racism to the surface. And I think that parents might not be as conscientious about understanding what they would need to be doing the baby steps that they need to take I feel in their like households. That's what you're going to do on March 5th. No, it's exactly what I'm going to do. It's and part of this too, right, is, is that... It's, it's, it's that awareness. It's the fact that mm -hmm. you know we can lean in, and, and it's okay. Hence the brave space. It's okay if there's a little level of discomfort, mm -hmm. but we're actually going to invite folks in. Uh, it's going to be a place where you can ask questions. You can ask me whatever you want to ask me, and I understand that that fear that may like pop up. And well, how about your experience working with these kids? Well. It Obviously, it's easy to be inspired working with this lady, and <laughs> I, I think you can see that. Um, this is a very interesting um, environment we live in. I've never experienced anything like this area. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Um, we're predominantly a white community, as we know, and there, it's a very, very liberal, artistic, aware community. Um, but I think that it's interesting that our children aren't really aware. It stops. There's something, mm -hmm. there's something going on where that conversation ends and there's not enough there. And the fact that we can read a book to kids and tell them facts and talk about history and open doors that they haven't been aware of is, to me, very inspiring. So um, it, it blows my mind that, you know, we're a nonprofit organization that's creating awareness, and we are just educating on history. Yeah, and I'm glad you used the phrase "opening doors," Paula, because that is exactly what you do. 
right, at the center for art and activism, yeah. right, is Open Doors. What has that been like for you, particularly in terms of the mission and the scope and opening doors, inviting folks into this community that's predominantly white to really inform them of injustices yeah. that are taking place? You know, the first few years, honestly, were exciting and there was so much interest and um, I felt, and still do, that we made a big dif we made a difference. You know, one of the mottos of the Peg Center is to be catalysts for conscious change. So we don't suppose that we can even instigate all of the change or know what all the change is, but we want to educate people about things that they could, if they really believed in it strongly enough, could change themselves. Honestly, in the last couple of years, I've become slightly uh, disappointed is not the word, but I felt like I was handing activism to my community on a silver platter. And we, do, you, do you mean that you're guiding them too much? That folks are not owning the work yeah, more? Yeah. Yeah. That that what we that what we do is create these fantastic events and programs that people are really learning about different voices, uh, whether it's the environment or human rights or social justice, anything, um, and, and they would feel really good about coming. Of course they would because they took the time to do that, but then we all went home feeling really good about ourselves and um, you know, I don't have a system in place to, to measure metrics, but I got the feeling that we weren't changing enough. So in the last 18 months or so, the board has been very supportive of like, it's time for us to get a little, with our, get our feet a little dirtier. And how, and how do we do that? And, and part of getting your feet dirty, is that where your relationship at the Peg Center and the YWCA here with Anne and Amanda have kind of come into the fold in yeah, terms of really yeah. making that work? It, it expands, I think it expands both of our voices. The Peg Center has never dealt with families before. That's a whole new arena of conversation for us. Um, that they are dedicated in their mission to becoming or to helping their community become anti-racist is really, really important. And you, I mean, like, I think together we're going to be able to come up with literal action items that we were searching for in the last few months to, like, together as a community, we can, we can make these shifts. I don't even know the answer yet. I'm, I bet you don't either about what it's going to take. But I think together, once the, all these conversations are on the table and the hard stuff is out there, we're going to be able to make some progress. No, and, and I agree with you. I think part of it, too, is really kind of taking a step back, inviting folks in, and, and asking them to do some of that work as we engage in this. And also the other thing, too, here is that there has to be a commitment Right, it has there has to be a commitment from folks who, who believe that, that this, this that, this country has gone into a status of fatigue when it comes to mm. anti-racism. Yeah. Oh, George Floyd, that was like, that was that was almost four years ago. Right, right? I'm, I'm I'm tired. I'm exhausted. It's time to time to move forward. Can't we talk and think about something else? These national political conversations have interfered with folks really leaning in and doing really good, thoughtful, soulful stuff that's there. And you know that's something that I'm consciously aware of and paying attention because I feel and I see, and not me. I have no time nor space in my life to be fatigued because if I'm fatigued, yeah. mm -hmm. then stuff just doesn't get done. Yeah. And that is not, people always tell me, well, Brother Carson, tell me, how do you, how do you r relax? How do you find that space? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out because I go and I go and I go and that's why yeah. I'm excited to work with the three of you yeah. in terms of how we do this. What concerns, right? And and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. What concerns do you have? And I just want to hear from all of you right now regarding where we are and how do we move forward in really advancing a community in terms of being anti-racist. I think it's a lot of things. I I can't, I can't really give you one clear answer. I think it's um, you know. How are we not, and why are we not a more inclusive community here? Why, why are we even having this conversation? To me, that's it right there. 
is it, you know, people say, well, is it, it's an economic thing, right? There's been a couple of things. That's my answer. Um, I don't know about that. I, I mean, yes, that's a, that's a portion of it. Um, I don't know. No, I, I hear you on that. Paul? I want to back up just one second Please. and say that part of the fatigue is we got a we got a hell of a year in front of us politically, and right our lives as we know it are at stake. Correct. How how do we talk about anti-racism in a in a context? I mean, how do we not give people too much to do? I guess I I'm not sure, but. Personally, my answer is I want to live in a community of diversity. I want to live in a community of cultural differences. Mm. To me, it has to start with knowing them, which is what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to bring people of color into our orbit to tell us what it's like to live here. And I can't help but think that once we know more, once we are educated, that we will begin to work together, to change together, to have a vision. I love that, That's my what friend. I'm oh, mm -hmm. thank you. Makes me want to cry. Because what if we can't? No, 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 no. Because that's right. Like, and people who know me, I, I was optimistic when I was in high school, and I was naive. I actually believe by the time I got to the point in my life that racism would have dissipated. Right? I wasn't calculating the role that capitalism and other things play into this formula. But now, I'm still hopeful. Because if we're not hopeful. Right? I'm still hopeful there's That's hope true. for the planet. I'm still hopeful that, you know, a lot of things that can happen that have to happen. I think for me, it's, I really think about, you know, authentic commitment. I feel that it's, cha it's, it's easy to come to an event. It's easy to hear everything. It's easy to say what's right and what's wrong. But there's a really big challenge when you then look at your own life and say, well, this is going to be a lot of work. Like, I have so many steps that I would have to take just in my own life to contribute right. to this. Right. Mm -hmm. I worry that, you know, we don't, you don't want people to, you know, feel defensive about where we all are. Every one of us is racist in one way or another. Right. Um, being able to acknowledge that doesn't mean that we have to feel shame or become defensive. You need people to just authentically know where they are, know where the community is, and be able to take authentic commitment into what it's going to take, to even if it's baby steps. You know, having people not have the fear to take those baby steps and to walk out of an event and really take it into their own life. You know, it's easy when other people are here organizing, like yeah. we're going to be organizing and you hear everything you want to hear at these events. And right. we really, I think for me, the big fear is, is that they're going to walk out and they go home and none of that translates into their own personal journey because the truth is is it's everybody's personal journeys together that actually starts this change well uh, and how and i tr i truly feel like it's our job as organizers to lay out some doable things for for people to do because you know, a quick anecdote was when we did meet last summer at my house. I was late, and you were at my front door, and one of my neighbors walked by and literally asked him if he needed assistance. Like, he was at my house for a meeting. <laughs> and what that did for me, Eddie, was made me realize all the ways that I need to change. How could I change my neighbor, my neighborhood, my community? This this is a big conversation, but we need to give people things that they can do. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. Actually, I, I, I worked that into my, my talk that I've been wow. working on and everything too, right? And again, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just giving an anecdote, but if you talk to most BIPOC folks, they can tell you an exact story, yeah. right? Very, very similar to that, whether they're just bird watching in Central Park, right? Or cooking on their grill in their backyard or right, one too many cars of black and brown folks pulling up into a house. The assumption becomes, is it, are they terrorists if they're a certain level of brown? Is it a crack house? I, I had a student who, um, she um, lived in, in Andover family, quite prominent family over there, and again, and that much like Newburyport, an affluent community, neighbors call the cops because they were a South Asian family, and the cops, or excuse me, the neighbors reported 
them by saying, I think there's a terrorist activity going on oh. based off the folks that are going. We all know the story of Skip Gates, right? The brilliant academic at Harvard who locked himself out and his own neighbors called the cops because he broke into his own home because he locked himself out through right. the window. We all know that. And, you know, Amanda, something you noted is the fact that, and that's my concern, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to rally the troops. Uh, we're going to lean in and we're going to think about this work. We're all going to do this. But I worry about all the great work that y'all are doing and folks go home and then they rest and they're done. Right. And I think the greatest challenge for us as organizers is reminding folks that we're just getting started. <laughs> we're just getting started. And how and can you not be involved. I guess that's my question to the to this community. How can you not? But that's a great question because I've actually been thinking about that mm -hmm. in terms of you know why does it just stop, right? Why does it why well, do we reach that block? You know, there's that and there's there's this this, this element too of, of 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 that fatigue of folks you know, you're kind of creeping in and saying, either it's not my job or, you know, I, there's nothing really for me to do. Or, you know, why are, why are the three of you bringing this information, bringing this stuff up? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or, or even concerns where people even question you on, what kind of content are you giving my kids? Really questioning, is it age appropriateness? Well, they're too young to learn about racism because you're never too mm -hmm. young to learn about racism. Those things I oftentimes wonder. What goes on in the head and in the souls of people as they're thinking about this stuff? I don't know. If we let our children know the truth, they will hurt. And their hurt is not a bad thing because their hurt will take the family to a whole different place because they don't they won't tolerate it anymore they can't tolerate it. they don't want to and they could be the leaders of their own families to change so you know we're thinking about this this community organizing this anti-racism work and, and folks if you're just chiming in here i'm here with paula Esty, ann upton and amanda bradbury of the peg center and of the ywca um, you're listening to wjop 96.3 you know the question becomes what do you want me to do, right, in, in terms of pushback? I, I, I'm a nice person. I'm a good person. I don't see color. I don't judge folks. Why do I have to lean into this? Why do I have to go hear Eddie Carson give one of his talks? And why do I have to go engage with other people of color about race when there's nothing about me that is contentious in that formulation or why do I have to really think about you know the other work that's going on how do we how do you respond to that when someone says but I'm, I'm fine or I'm busy I'm just a nice person I just want to live my life pay my bills and go home raise my kids if you're raising kids I think what we have to push back with is that people who, in my opinion, that's someone who's not racist, <laughs> that unfortunately, if you are willing to, to sit there in that just sort of non-racist place, you actually participate in so many levels of systemic racism that you might not even be aware that you're participating in, and, and you just continue. But then, but, but, but Amanda, but yet, someone's gonna say though, but see, right there, you just said, I don't wanna show up because you're saying if I'm just not actively engaged, that makes me a racist or I'm doing this, so why would I show up? Because not enough will change unless you do. Mm. We'll just keep going into Circles. white wealth oblivion <laughs> here in the Newburyport area, and it'll spread out from us, and pretty soon we'll only see our white noses out there, and that, it just, it's not life. It is not what we want. I have a question for the three of you, and this is a question that I, I, I ask all folks, right? It's a tough question. And so you can only, you can give me what comes to the top of your head. It's not a fair question. I'm putting you on a spot here, okay? And um, do you remember 
the first racist thought or idea or behavior you engaged in in your life? Hmm. And, I, and while you're thinking about it, I'm going to give you yeah. a chance to ponder. Because, you know, I remember for me, when I was a little bitty kid, I had to go see Santa Claus. I got a picture. And, you know, later I learned from my, my mom that, you know, I cried when I had to go see oh, Santa wow. Claus. Because, you see, society for me is like a four, five-year-old had told me that I wasn't good enough because, see, Santa was black. And I cried because how is Santa going to know what I want mm. for Christmas mm. when that can't be Santa? Because mm. Santa's black. Mm. Mm. I do remember. I remember being five years old on Cranes Beach. We lived in Ipswich. And there were five or six beautiful black boys playing in the water. And I remember that my first feeling was fear. Mm -hmm. And to this day, the shame that bubbles up in me, and there was no conversation in my family. There was no, I guess I didn't feel safe enough to come to my mother or father and talk about it. Uh, so I buried it and I just feel to, anyway, that is not, a legacy that I'm proud of, but that was that's how it was. But but it's important in terms of who you are now, right? And and again, and, and the folks who are listening who are going to show up for this work, you know, it's not about you know where you're at; it's where we're going to go. And I think that's the key thing. And Amanda, how about how about the two of you? You know, I don't necessarily. I don't know if I remember the first time that I actually engaged. What I do remember is being very young, and I had a grandmother. Um, who, who was an older grandmother. I was on the younger end of a large family. And I can remember her coming up for dinner and I think that we had a family that moved into our neighborhood at the time that was black. And we had, there were definitely black people in my community, but not necessarily in a very small neighborhood. And I remember that she used racial slurs and talking about those black people. And I recall not understanding, but I do recall, you know, thinking that that was like, okay, like that's what they must be called. I had, I didn't understand that there mm. would be, and my, my mom, luckily, luckily I had a mom who is <laughs> very good um, and had a lot of conversations with me after the fact. Um, and so I, I very quickly learned, but that's my first like remembrance. I remember literally being in like almost in a high chair and hearing mm. these terms, something, you know, and, and just thinking to myself, Oh, is that what what you call people who have? I, you know, I thought mm -hmm. they looked like M and M's. I thought I, I had no idea, and I thought, okay, so this is what we're gonna call them. And my mom kind of having a big conversation with me after. It's my mm -hmm. first recollection of something racist that was happening oh, in my household. Good for mama. Good for mama. How about you, Ann? Any memories? Any thoughts? You know, he recognizing yeah. these changes with memories, right? For sure. Yeah, recall. for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, growing up in a very open household, my parent my parents have always been incredibly open and we've had conversations and I grew up um, in, in Worcester Mass as I think I said before so all my friends are multiracial racial. Um, but I think the first moment I can't remember really how old I was I might have been in junior high taking the bus to go downtown in Worcester and I remember and then this happened to me again as a young woman dating um, a person of color a man of color in Boston um, I was asked by my friend to stand in front so that they would stop and the bus would stop or that the, the taxi would stop for us. And for me, so that was a bit of a reverse for me understanding of, you know, why. Absolutely. And I, I just, I, ever since I was little, I remember my mom and my dad saved all my papers. I mean, um, this has been huge for me since I was little. And I think it was my parents that instilled this cause in me. Mm -hmm. And this is the first community that I've seen that just is very different, and I would like our children to have more yeah. awareness. And, and, and I think that's part of the, the longer scale work, and it's not, it's about the individuals at the individual level and working with folks here mm. uh, in terms of the work that you're doing, the work that we're doing and organizing this. But it's also 
the work of challenging City Hall. It's the work of challenging businesses and banks and industries and how we make decisions on an economic, on a, a social political right. level in terms of being a wholly inclusive because you got those structural aspects that are playing a role. As we get to the end here of Race Matters, Paula, I'm going to ask you, if you will, remind our readers, our readers, our listeners, um, about the events coming up. Sure thing. So we launch our anti-racism series on March 5th with your beautiful talk at FRS Unitarian Universalist Church at 6.30 p.m. Suggested donation is $10. Go to the Peg Center website to register. It's thepegcenter.org to register and make a donation. Um, All of our events are on that website for all of us. On Thursday, uh, let's see, March 21st is our first community conversation in which we are going to sit and listen to each other and invite people of color to um, explore and tell us about their experiences of being part of this community. And then on April 18th, these are all at 6.30 and all at the Peg Center on 3 Harris Street, um, Anne and Amanda will be leading a community conversation about how do families talk about racism and uh, take questions and answers on that. And then our final evening, which to me is almost the most important one on Thursday, May 16th, is the one in which the mayor, the city councilors, and uh, hopefully business people will be there, not at their podiums, but as part of the round table of what do we do and what is our commitment to this, you know. Thank you, thank you. As I always do with my guests, I like to give my guests the final word as we bring the show to an end. And I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna go to Amanda, Paula. I'm gonna conclude with you. And I'm just gonna ask each of you to tell me a hope or a wish you have in terms of doing this community work. Please don't be afraid to open your minds and your hearts to being a part of this community. We, we need to make our children as aware as they can be, and the future is theirs and ours. Mm. I hope that we can be seen as a resource. I really hope that people can um, see us as a resource in this work. And, and helping to create whatever platforms they need, whatever change they need, whatever education they need um, to be able to come on this journey with us. My parting thought is that we're all in it together and let's sit down and work this out so that we can all walk down the street and see people of color and diverse cultures in our businesses and our schools and our streets and homes. We need it. To my brilliant, beautiful, radical, and activist (laughs) friends who are here, who are getting stuff done, who are organizing, I thank you so much for joining me here at Race Matters. Take care, folks.